seat in front of you, and if you would fill that out and put it in the offering bag later in the service, we will get a record of your visit. Uh, join with us as we sing. As, as we stand, please. These are the days of Elijah, the prophet of the Lord who announced so many great things about our God. The days of David, the king, who built the temple of praise. We're going to be singing about that this morning. These are the days of Elijah. Church, I want you to get your hands together this morning as we sing. Can you do that with you? I think it's good for us to do that. They just say, clap your hands, all of you people. Shout out to God with a voice of triumph. These are the days of life. So let's sing again. Here we go. These are the days of Elijah.
redeemed and so how does the world know what we are when we walk around with a glum look on our face? I'm redeemed. I have a difference in my life and in my heart from what Jesus has done for me. Are you really happy in the Lord? Man, he's given you the next breath. You ought to be. We have so much to be thankful for, so much to be grateful for. We're going to sing that again. And this time, this is just for him, not for me. But I want the Lord to know he's looking down on us, y'all. He is here with us, redeemed and so happy in Jesus. You don't have to be giddy and jump pews and stuff, but you can be excited about it. Let's sing that again. Redeemed.
the song of the redeemed. We have the opportunity today, and we've done that, to tell him, say, Lord, I'm redeemed, and I thank you for that. And I want to proclaim to you that I love you, Lord. Let's sing that to you. I love you, Lord. And every voice sing, I live. see what God says about heaven. And uh, while you're turning to Revelation chapter 4, we're going to begin in verse 1 and just read uh, what the Apostle John wrote and what he experienced about heaven and then kind of dig into that. Uh, I just want to say that uh, <clears throat> we always miss being here, Catherine and I do, uh, when we're out of town. And uh, But this last Sunday, we just had a great opportunity to go and see some other parts of God's country. I told somebody, I said, God just showed out uh, over there. It was uh, <clears throat> really, really nice uh, in the Santa Fe, Mexico area. And uh, we got to do some whitewater river rafting with uh, both my sons and three grandsons. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, I held my own, uh, <laughs> did my part, you know, uh, didn't fall in. So I feel like that was, that was something. So there we all are, about to, uh, about to get in and get started, 15 miles each day, uh, you know, s just suffering at night. We uh, <laughs> spent the night on the river and, you know, had ribeye steaks and <laughs> salmon cooked over an open fire and, you know, mashed potatoes and chocolate cake <laughs> in a Dutch oven. <laughs> It was really hard. We made it. We made it. We got back. And uh, so anyway, it was great. I, I know that Pastor Todd did a great job in ministering the word. And aren't we just glad to have him and Pastor Wes. And it's just good for me to be able to, to take off and to be gone and know that things are going to be taken care of here. So I appreciate you supporting them. I want us to talk this morning about heaven I want to do kind of a flyover, if you will. I'm not going to necessarily deep dive into anything, um, just kind of a little flyover. And I want us to read 
Let's start in Revelation chapter 4, uh, verse 1. And John writes, he says, After these things, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after these things. Immediately, I was in the spirit. That means it wasn't his physical body. It was his spirit went. And behold, the first thing he saw in heaven was what? It was a throne. I saw a throne standing in heaven and one sitting on the throne. And he who was sitting like a jasper st stone and a sardis in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne like an emerald in appearance. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and upon the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their heads. Now what he's doing is he's giving us a picture of heaven as it was presented to him. And out from the throne come flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which were the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal. And in the center and around the throne, four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first creature was like a lion, the second like a calf, the third like, had the face like that of a man, and the fourth was like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and day and night they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. And when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever. And of course, that is the Lord who has no end and no beginning. And will cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power, because you created all things. And because of your will, they existed and were created. Now, here's what I want us to ask ourselves. When you read something like that, you just, you just got to come back with a question and you ask yourself, when was the last time that I thought about heaven? When God makes such a huge matter about it, when the Bible is all about it, when it's all about getting ready to go there, when it's all about not missing it, when was the last time that we thought about heaven? When was the last time that you talked to somebody about heaven? You just need to think about that and ask ourselves, how important is heaven to me? You know, I, I don't mean at death. I mean, if, if I was facing death, I think all of us would say, well, I, you know, I certainly want to make heaven and not the other place. And so for us, it, that would be really important at the point of death. But the thing is, is heaven longed for as a location that, that you want to go there, you want to, you want to be there, and that is the thing that's in your heart on, on a consistent basis. You know, we can, we can tell a friend, you need to know Jesus so that when you die, you can go to heaven. But how is that going to be, and this is, this is the thought that I had, how is that going to be effective with them if they have no idea what you're talking about? They have no means of relating to that. And so the whole thing is that God, through this message, what I want to do is I want to, I want to kind of prepare you and me to talk to somebody about heaven, to be able to, to tell them what heaven is like from the viewpoint of Holy Scripture. God doesn't tell us everything, but he tells us enough to want to stir us up, to want to go there and to be there. So if you look in your life point outline, number one, the first thing that I think we ought to tell somebody about heaven is there are no round trips. There are no round trips to heaven or hell. 
And the reason I say that is because there's a lot of misinformation out there floating around in our generation and for the last several years about heaven and hell. And they started coming out in books, if you remember sometime back. It's back around 1995 that I, I first started being aware of this, and, and maybe you did as well. You know, when the New Age movement started. You remember that? New Age stuff all started coming out, you know, and what your name was out on the limb, you know. Um, and so there's a lot of this hocus pocus that started coming out. And what happened was it began to infiltrate the Christian community. Because there started to be a, a plethora of books coming out. And there was a lot of misinformation. Really, it's not it's misinformation. It was lies. Because Satan is always desiring to pull people away from the truth. And there was a lot of misinformation about life after death. This whole thing about people going to heaven and, and going to hell and then coming back. And I actually want you to know, I don't buy those books, never have, uh, about you know, near-death experiences where somebody says that they went to what they called was he heaven or to what they called was hell and, and they came back and now they've written a book about it to tell you about it. There was a book that came out it was the author was Kevin Malarkey, which I thought was appropriate. <laughs> and it was co-authored by his son, Alex. And the title of it was The Boy Who Came Back from Heaven. And um, it was a, a bestseller, and it was all a lie. Not an ounce of truth to it. Alex's mother, Beth, came clean with the community and... and, and um, with the news agencies, she went public. This is what she said. She said, it's all a lie. All of it is a lie. It's malarkey, she said. None of it is true. And my son, who is now quadriplegic from the accident, is mortified and embarrassed that his father is telling lies. He didn't die. He didn't go to heaven. And he didn't come back. It's all a lie. Now, the amazing thing is, the evangelical printing community didn't kill the book and pull it off the shelves because it was a cash cow. I mean, it was, it was selling like crazy. And so they didn't do that. Kevin came out a little bit later when he turned 16 and he made a public statement. And this is what he said. I said I went to heaven because I thought it would get me attention. I didn't die. I didn't go to heaven. And when I made the claims, I had never read the Bible. People have profited from lies, and they continue to. And this is what he said. They should read the Bible, which is enough. Isn't that amazing? Now, how do we know? How do you know that what I'm telling you is true? That you don't just take it because I'm up here saying it. How do you know that it is true that you, and that you shouldn't, you shouldn't waste your money on books about people who say that they've died and gone to heaven or died and gone to hell and came to Tell about it. How do I know that those are deceptive lies of the evil one? How do I know that? Because of the Bible. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. And just as each person is destined to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ died once to take away sin. There's no round trip tickets, ladies and gentlemen. You don't die and get to go experience heaven and then come back to, to get a second chance. So you can believe and make a decision. That's one of the messages that we need to share with our friends and our loved ones. There is no second chance. There's no second opportunity to make a decision for Christ. The only one who's ever gone to heaven and come from heaven to tell us what it's like is the Lord Jesus. He's the only one who the Bible says has come down from heaven. And somebody say, well, didn't the apostle Paul get, up, get taken up to heaven? Yes, he did. But he was forbidden to say anything about it. It seems as though that the only one who is permitted to talk about heaven is the Lord Jesus Christ. And then what he tells us then through scriptures such as Ezekiel and through the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ. So don't waste your money on books about trips to heaven because they're fakes and they are designed to pull you away from the truth. They're designed to give you false hope. They're designed to blind your eyes. Now, number two I want to share with you is this, what heaven is. We're talking about what heaven is. Heaven is a lot of things. Well, I don't want to go there. 
Because I'm born again. How many of you know that you're born again? Raise your hand. Get up. Amen. Listen, you know what's in heaven? Your Father. He who loved you from the, for the foundation of the world. He is the one who set his love on you. He is the one who sent his son to die for you. He is the one who called on the Holy Spirit to chase after you and to corner you and me and to break our will and to make us willing to come to him. Can you say amen to that? Amen. That's who's there. Your father is there. He who made you and formed you in your mother's womb. Our Savior is there. Our eternal family is there. Our brothers and sisters in the Lord, our moms and our dads, our sons and our daughters who have died, who, but who had trusted in Christ and are gone on before us. There's a book in heaven. It's called the Book of Life. And my name is there. And if you've been born again, your name is in heaven. Your name is written down on one of the pages of the holy book, the book of life. And that book declares, when the book is open, it will declare, saved, born again, redeemed, God's own, released from judgment. Can you say amen? amen. That's what is there. Our inheritance is, it, inheritance is there. My room in my father's house in the New Jerusalem is there. And Jesus is making it for me. My reward is there. And yours is as well. And the truth in your outline, everything we will have for eternity is in heaven. The Hebrew word for heaven is Shemayim. And it means the heights. The Greek word for heaven is Uranus. And means highly elevated. And so when the Bible talks about heaven, it talks about three heavens. As in 2 Corinthians 12 in verse 2, it says, Paul was caught up to the third heaven. Let me give them to you. The first heaven is the atmospheric heaven. It's in Isaiah 55 in verse 9. And it describes the air that is around us and above us. That's the blue sky that we see. That's the atmospheric heaven. And then number two is the stratospheric heaven. A $30 word that means where the planets and the stars are. That's Psalm 19 in verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God. When you see the universe, when you see the Milky Way galaxy and all the millions of galaxies of this universe, they declare a creator. There's no way in the world that could have ever happened. And then the third heaven is the divine heaven. And that's the abode of God. That is where our Father God manifests his glorious presence. He is everywhere. But there is a peculiar concentration of God. Heaven is his dwelling place. It is where he is. And it's described in the revelation of Jesus Christ and some in Ezekiel. Now heaven in the Bible is so connected with God that sometimes heaven is a synonym for God. And in other words, they mean the same thing, such as the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. Those are referring to the same thing. It's the realm where God rules as sovereign. So look at the truth in your outline. God fills heaven, so to go to heaven is to go to God. When I die and go to heaven, I'm going to God. When you die and go to heaven, you're going where? You're going to God because he fills heaven. And then the third thing this morning is that heaven is a location. Look at the truth in your outline. Just, just to say it biblically, <laughs> heaven is a location. Now, there's no map. There's no, there's no map how to get there. Because heaven exists as best as I can try to wrap my feeble South Arkansas mind around this. It exists out time, outside of time and space because there is no time there. And it is outside of our world. Um, whenever the Bible talks about heaven, it always uses the term, two-letter word, up. Always about heaven. Heaven is up. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 2. Paul was caught up to the third heaven. Ephesians chapter 4. Jesus went up 
are ascended to the heights. The angels in Acts chapter 1, they said Jesus had gone up into heaven and would so come in like manner as he was seen to go up. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 says at the rapture of the church, Christ will come down out of heaven and the church will be raptured and taken where? Up into heaven. So wherever heaven is, it's up. Look at the truth. Heaven is a realm outside of ours and the Bible says heaven is up. So how far is heaven from you and me biblically? Well, Pluto, the planet Pluto is in our Milky Way galaxy. It is several billion miles away and if you went all the way to Pluto, you still wouldn't see God. You still wouldn't be in heaven. You get away from our solar system, in other words, our sun and, and the planets that are going around you, you get away from that and you go out into the Milky Way galaxy. Alpha Centauri is 20 billion miles from our solar system. The North Star, which you see in the sky, right? 400 billion miles from us. And we're looking at that light. The, 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 the star, Beltagoose, is 880, this is in our galaxy, 880 quadrillion miles, and that star is 200 million miles in diameter. If you were to put it where our sun is, it would swallow uh, Venus, Mars, Mercury, and Earth, and come almost to Jupiter. It would just virtually swallow our, our solar system. And that's just our Milky Way galaxy. And there is an infinite number of galaxies in the universe just like ours, the nearest being Andromeda, which is one and a half million light years away. And it is traveling at a speed of 186,000 miles a second. And each of these thousands of millions of galaxies in which there are no less than 100 million stars or suns. <laughs> it's huge out there. Now here's the question I'm gonna put in your outline. How can evolution possibly explain a wonder like that? That's why the Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God. God made all of that and you haven't even got to him when you get to the end of that, wherever that is. God is beyond that. So once we go as far as we can go outside our galaxy and beyond this infinite number of galaxies, we never reach heaven. And yet Jesus turned to the thief on the cross who called out to him and he said, Today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus said, You know how fast you're going to get there? Just like that. So how is that possible? Well, Jeremiah 23, 30, 24 says, God said, do I not fill the heavens? Let me tell you something. While I was trying to get this message together, I almost want to sit on the floor and, and just go to blubbering. <laughs> I quickly can get beyond my abilities. I'm trying not to do that. Just to stay, stay right here in, in, in the reading and, and all this. But here's the truth. Heaven and earth coexist in two completely independent realms. This is the best I understand it. There, there are angels here this morning with us. Would you agree with that? Yes. They've been with God's people all through the ages. Hebrews 1.14, angels are spirits sent to care for the people who will inherit salvation. So our Lord Jesus Christ is here with us today, right now. Angels are with us. God our Father is with us. We could die right now if I was to drop dead on this platform before my body crumpled to the floor. I would be with him. I believe an angel would take me there, would greet me, and take me there. And I find in Holy Scripture that the angels have appeared suddenly to God's people throughout biblical Scripture. And the Bible says they would appear and then they would be gone as quickly as it was with Simon Peter. You remember in Acts chapter 12. Verse 7 and, and verse 10. Peter was in prison and suddenly there was an angel beside him and kicked him in the side. I assume that was gently. And, uh, and woke him up, let him out. The doors just opened and the gates opened and, and he let him out and finally into the city street and then suddenly the angel was gone. 
Why? He stepped back over. He stepped right over out of earth, right into heaven. And then there were Samson's parents, visited suddenly by an angel in Judges 13 and 10. And when they made a sacrificial offering on a rock to the Lord, the Bible says the angel then went into the flame and he ascended up into heaven and suddenly he was gone. So one day heaven is going to invade this universe. Heaven is going to come down. But for now, heaven is up. It's in another dimension. There is travel from heaven to earth. But it, all, it is always from there to here. And it is by command and will of the Lord. There is only one way to travel from here to there. And that is to die. But when we die, it is to be immediately with him. And so number four, what is heaven like? What heaven is like? Well, Ezekiel 1 says, <laughs> it is wheels within wheels and fire and lights and spinning things, <laughs> which as best I can understand it in reading from different theologians, that is a picture of heaven as a war machine gearing up to bring judgment, which is what the book of Ezekiel is about, the coming judgment of God upon upon the land. But in Revelation, in our text, Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1, the Bible says there is this open door. So a door to heaven opens. After these things, I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I hear like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after these things. In other words, after the things on the earth, after the time, because what you just got in the first two chapters of Revelation is the church age. It's all about the churches. And then it says in chapter 4, after, let me show you what's going to happen after these things. After the period of the church. After the day of the church. When it enters into the tribulational period. When the church is raptured out. And he says in chapter 4, come up here. In other words, when the church comes up. When the church of Jesus Christ is raptured into heaven. Then when you start in Revelation chapter 4, you start seeing everything that's going to happen. And you get these pictures, there are these stones that are in heaven, and they represent the riches, these beautiful jewels that are in heaven that he describes. There's the rainbow, which is a picture of God's faithfulness that God put there, and he told to Noah, he said, I put my bow in the cloud, and I promise you that the flood will never again come upon the earth. So, so the rainbow is always a picture of the faithfulness of God. God is always faithful. God is always faithful. God is always what? Faithful. I may not understand what he's doing. I may not understand his ways. I may not understand why he's letting happen what happens. But God is always faithful. That's why he put the bow in the heaven. He said, I will be here. I will take care of you. I make promises that last forever. I am a God who is faithful. And around the throne of God are 24 thrones. 24 elders sitting in these white garments, which is the righteousness of the saints, and these golden crowns of reward from the Lord. God honors you and me who follow after him. And he says, these are the 12 apostles of the New Testament, the 12 patriarchs of the Old Testament. That is a picture of that all the redeemed of all time because of Christ are now in heaven. All of them are in heaven. From Adam all the way to our parents and our friends who have died even in the last few days. And in Revelation 4 and verse 10 it says, The elders fall down before him who sat on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. And they cast their crowns before the throne saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things and because of your will they existed and were created. Here's the truth. The throne of God dominates heaven. Every being, every human, every angelic individual worships God as creator. Now listen, that is very important for you and me to understand that because God has brought it out in scripture. Here's the truth I want you to see. To buy into evolution, this is why I keep talking about it. This is why I keep saying it. Because to buy into evolution diminishes God as creator. It assaults heaven. And eternity will be filled with the worship of God the Father as what? Creator. He will be worshipped as our creator. Then in chapter 5, there's another element of worship. For out for between the throne is the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus, and he is worshipped. And he says, worthy are you to take the book and break its seals. For you were slain and purchased with God with your blood 
you have purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. So here's the truth. Heaven's highest activity is the worship of God the Father as creator and the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior and Redeemer. That's what we're going to do in heaven. You want to know what heaven is going to be about? Heaven is going to be about worship. We're going to be so caught up with looking at the creator of everything. Him who has no, no beginning and no end. And we're going to see him. We're going to see the glory of God in heaven. And it's going to absolutely captivate us. Now, number five, the big change. Revelation 20, chapter 21 and chapter 22. There's this huge change that occurs in heaven. 21 and 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared. That's the, our earth now, our universe, the, the Milky Way galaxy, all this will disappear. And the sea was also gone. Our universe is an atom bomb. The whole universe. It is, it is a universe that is filled with atoms. And we have learned how to split the atom. And when you split the atom, horrible things can happen. The huge explosions. And Peter says in 2 Peter, someday the elements will melt with fervent heat. And so the Bible says there is coming a day when the entire supercharged universe is going to implode upon itself. And it's going to go out of existence. And God is going to make a new heaven and a new earth. And in Revelation 21 and 22, heaven is described in its final form. It is a physical place because God is going to make a new universe and a new earth. And heaven is going to come into our realm. God is going to make this new universe. He's going to make it heaven. And, and there's going to be a city. Now, God doesn't say that's the only city. He just says there's a city. And it is the new Jerusalem, the city of God. And it will descend out of heaven and come to this new earth that will have no sea. And it is going to sit there and it's going to be like the capital of, of the universe. And all who are saved are going to live in it in physical, glorified, resurrected bodies. And the Bible says, God will wipe away every tear from our eye. He will dwell among us. There will be no more death. No more mourning or crying or pain. And in 2110 and following, it says, The holy city shines like a sparkling gem. It has a great high wall with 12 gates, and each gate is a, at each gate is an angel. So there's three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, three gates on the west. And in 2121 of, of uh, Revelation, it says that every gate is a pearl. They're not pearly gates. They're gates of pearl. pearl. You say, man, I'd like to see that oyster. <laughs> Huge gates that adorn the city. Now, how are pearls made? There's a sand or an irritation in the clam, right? And it begins to try to take care of that irritation. And so it starts covering it with this, this mother of pearl. And it keeps covering it and covering it and covering it until you've got this beautiful thing called a pearl. Do you realize that for all eternity, whenever I go and come out of the city of my father, I will pass through the gate of pearl. And every time I look at that gate, I'll be reminded that my father came after me. And through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ, I who was, I who was an irritation in the universe of my father, I who was filled with sin, I who was filled with everything that was against my father, I have been covered in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And God has made me, who was an irritation, into something of beauty. It's not me, it's him. And every time I go in and out of that city, every time you go in and out of the, the gates, you will be reminded there is a father and he has loved you and he has made you into something you could have never made yourself into. Can you give God a hand clap of praise? In 2116, this city is absolutely amazing. It is laid out on a square or a cube. Its length is equal to its width and its height. The Bible says the Holy of Holies in, in the temple of Moses, the tabernacle, and as well as in the temple that David built was 20 by 20 by 20. 
The New Jerusalem is 1,500 miles wide in, in each four, uh, four directions, and it is 1,500 miles straight up. Now, we can't hardly even comprehend that, but it will go from the Canadian border all the way down to the tip of Florida, from the East Coast all the way to the Mississippi River if you were to set it on the United States, and it would go 1,500 miles straight up. It would have a square footage on the ground floor of two and a quarter million square miles, or total two and a quarter million square miles, and could accommodate, they, they believe, about 100 billion people. God has made a city. In this city, there is no sun or moon because our Father and the Lamb are the light. The gates never shut because there is no night. There is no liar. There is no unclean person. There is only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. What makes heaven heaven? 22 verse 4, and they will see his face and his name will be written on their foreheads. That alludes back to Revelation 14 and verse 1 and Ezekiel chapter 9 verse 4 where God marks those that are his with a mark on their forehead. And it identifies every soul as belonging to God. And we know that during the tribulational period, Lucifer is going to mark his with the 666 here on your forehead. He is simply a copycat of the Lord God. God is the first one to mark his people. And what God is simply saying in 2 Timothy 2.19, the Lord knows those who are his. You may struggle whether you know whether or not you're going to have. Let me tell you something. God knows. God knows those who are his. And if you will take him at his word, you can be at peace, you can be at rest, because God wants you to know that you know that you know that you belong to him and that you're coming to him. And God has already put upon you his mark. Now, let me give you some closing thoughts and I'm going to be done. Let me talk about time. Mama went home to heaven in 2004. It's been 12 years. And mother has no idea how long she's been in heaven. She doesn't know. Why? Because heaven is one eternal moment. There is no future. There is no past. It is just now. When you get to heaven, there's no sin. There's no suffering. There's no pain. There's no doubt. There's no fear of God's displeasure. There's no temptation. There's no division. There's no hatred. There's no quarreling. There's no anger. There's no more praying. There's no more fasting. There's no repentance. There's no confession of sin. There's no weeping. There's no preaching. <laughs> out of a job. There's no evangelism. That's heaven. That's heaven. What about our bodies? Philippians 3 says we'll have one like Jesus. We can, we can be in one place one moment and be in another one the next. It's called a quantum leap. We're just there. We can eat. We can eat just like Jesus did when he came to the disciples after his resurrection. He said, give me some fish. Give me something to drink. And he ate and he drank. And then he just went through the wall. <laughs> Is that weird or what? He said, how in the world do you do that? You eat real stuff and yet you can, you can go through a wall. What? Our digestive system will be completely different. Our skin will be different as will our bones and our muscles. Second, our 1 Corinthians 15, 35 says it will be a heavenly body. God's just going to make something different. It, it's going to be me. You're going to know it's me, but I'm, I'm going to be totally different. Our bodies will be suited for eternal praise. You'll never get tired of singing. Your voice will never get weary. We'll be ready for eternal service. We'll never grow tired and eternal usefulness to the Lord. And in our relationship to others, that's the third thing, we will fellowship with angels. We will share joy with the angels. We'll worship alongside the angels. 1 Corinthians 6 says angels will serve us. Catherine and I will know each other. She will no longer be my wife. I'll no longer be her husband. But I will love her more perfectly than I've ever been able to love her on earth. Why will I not be a husband to her nor she be a wife to me? Because the need for procreation is gone. It no longer exists. Why does God have men and women marry? Why does God have men and women to produce children? Because of God's redemptive plan through procreation. His plan is for us to pass righteousness from generation to generation. And when you get to heaven, it's all done. It's no more. Your work in that is finished. Do we deserve heaven? No. The point today is this. 
God offers you heaven. That's what's coming. Do you deserve it? No. But it's offered. And the most important thing today is to make sure you're going to get there. That you're going to go to heaven. How do you do it? You enter the narrow gate. You go through that which is not easy. You do the hard thing. You repent. You admit you're a sinner. You admit Christ was needed for you. You admit there's no way on God's eternity you could ever merit heaven. You could not earn it. You're not good enough to earn it. You see yourself in all of your filth and all of your unacceptableness, and you realize that the Lamb of God died on the cross for you, and Christ is your only hope. And you flee to Him. You fall at His feet. You plead His forgiveness. You feel all the embarrassment of your sin before a holy God, and you plead His forgiveness. And you surrender your life to Him. You yield to Him, who is your only hope. Because you are a sinner in need of saving. And you call upon him to do what only he can do. And that is to change you. And to make you different. God, make me something different. Make me new. Let's bow our heads. In these few moments before we close this morning. I want to give you an opportunity this morning. Would you this morning just in honesty to me. No one's looking around but me. But if you're not sure. You're really concerned about whether or not you're, you're going to make heaven. That wherever you are, no one's looking, no one will see but me. That you just raise your hand and say, Brother John, I just want you to pray for me. I want to know that I know that I'm going to heaven when I die. And right now, I just, I'm, Pastor, I'm trembling. I don't, I don't know. And I want to be sure. Amen. Thank you for being honest. Raise your hand and you can just make sure I see it. Then you can put it down. Anybody else? Just lift your hand wherever you are. Amen. I see your hand. Just raise, lift your hand. There it is. Go it up. Put it up. No one's looking. Just me. I want to know that I know I'm going to heaven when I die. Listen, it's about calling out to him. It is about knowing him. And he comes to us. Jesus comes to us. You know he's here this morning. He's calling out to you. And he wants you to admit, Lord, I know you died on the cross for me. And I ask you to save me. Forgive me. Change me. God, change me. I've got to change. And admit to him, you can't change yourself. Admit that. God, I can't change me. I need you to make me new and different on the inside. God, make me new. I give my life to you. You've got to lay your life in his hands. You've got to lay your life in his hands. Lord, take me, use me. I want to come to heaven when I die. I want to be different. I want to come home at that time. Now I want you to do something. I want you to take a connect card. And I want you to print your name on there where I can read it. And say, I'm trusting Christ today. And I want you to think about setting up a time to come and either talk with me or talk with one of our pastors. Maybe another pastor here you'd like to visit with. That's perfectly fine with me. But I want you to take that, do something because you really want change. Write your name and how to best contact you on that card. And drop it by the information desk out here in the center of the wall before you leave this morning. Or you can bring it down here to the front to me and leave it with me personally. Do something today. Take a step forward. And let us help you in your journey. Now, Father, thank you. Thank you today for what you've done. Thank you for the word on heaven. And now we pray, Lord, you'll be with us as we leave this place, making eternal changes in our life. Thank you for the hope of heaven and for what's ahead. And we bless you now in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. Watch the screen and then you're dismissed. Hey church, I'm Chris Smith, Director of Tech Arts here at Arlington. If you're ever looking for an area to serve, come see me or anyone at the back, and we'll find you a place on a great team. We're always looking for more people to help. Here's a few things that are happening on the hill. If you're wanting to be a BBS teacher, come to the Treehouse at 4 p.m. today. 
Jeffy's having a meeting for all the VBS teachers. The deadline for our middle school camp is next Sunday. Don't let your son or daughter miss out on this year's camp. Contact Todd or sign up online at harmonyhill.org slash junior high camp 2016. Also, mark your calendars because the Women of Harmony are having a retreat September 30th through October 1st. Contact Ms. Catherine for more information. Thanks everyone for joining us this morning and have a great day. And don't forget your daughter.